So the last time we saw Lamar Jackson on a football field was December 4th before he left that week 13 game against Denver with a knee setback. Could this be the week that number eight returns to practice, Sarah? Well, they use John Harbaugh's words, Bobby. We'll just have to wait and see. But NFL Network's Ian Rappaport certainly seems to think so, which sparked debate among a couple national pundits. Stay tuned for all of that and more just ahead. I'm Bobby Trossett alongside Sarah Ellison. It's Tuesday, December 27th, and this is your Morning Ravens Vault. The Ravens have officially clinched the playoffs, but what that playoff road will look like will be determined by the next two games. Yes, playoff seating looms large, and I've got a big picture look at what they might look like. Plus, we're going inside the numbers on Ravens right tackle Morgan Moses, who according to PFF's grading system, has been one of the league's top offensive tackles over the last two months of football. We have all that and more coming up. Thank you for waking up with the Morning Vault, where you get the most important Ravens news in about 15 minutes. All right, Bobby. Well, after blessing us with his special message to close out his post-game press conference Saturday night after the Falcons game on Christmas Eve, yeah, John Harbaugh wasn't exactly in the Christmas spirit anymore during his Monday media availability. Yeah, no, he certainly wasn't, partner, which makes me wonder how Santa treated him this year. But We'll have more on that coming up in quick hits later on. Let's begin with Lamar Jackson because number eight, as we know, has been sidelined the last three games with his PCL sprain in that knee. And we had thought he would have returned to practice last week based on that initial one to three week timetable, but that never came to fruition. Now, Harbs was asked if he expects Lamar to give it a go on the practice fields this week, and this is what he had to say. Uh, we just have to see. Well, based on what NFL Network's Ian Rappaport had to say Monday morning, it sounds like Lamar is going to give it a shot at practice come Wednesday. This week is where all eyes turn. They're going to put him on the field this week, see if he can make football moves, see if his knee is ready. But it's going to be fascinating to see, does the fact that the Ravens have already clinched a playoff spot alter the timeline for Lamar. Do they want to not put him in harm's way to make sure that he's healthy for the playoffs? Another story that we will be tracking going forward. Yeah, Sarah, I know you're with me on this since we covered it at the end of our instant reaction Saturday night after the Falcons win. But to me, it's pretty simple. While the Ravens have already secured a spot in the postseason, there is still a ton to play for. And as long as number eight is medically cleared come Sunday night under the primetime lights, I want to see him out there competing. Yeah, this is a no-brainer for me, Bobby. Listen, nobody here is advocating to rush number eight back, but as long as two criteria are met, one, that he's medically cleared, and two, that he feels comfortable playing on that knee, he should absolutely play. That would be the best for the Ravens, the offense, and for Lamar Jackson himself. Remember, the offense lost its rhythm long before Lamar went down, and it has yet to get it back. So to wait until a high stakes playoff game against the AFC's elite, that would be a terrible position to put Lamar in and his teammates. I mean, he hasn't seen a live snap in four weeks, Bobby. Why would you put him out there cold if you don't have to? So if he's healthy, you're putting him in the best position by easing him in now. But you know who isn't on the same page with us, Bobby? That would be former NFL linebacker turned Fox Sports analyst, Emmanuel Acho. If I'm Lamar Jackson and you know knees are not something to play with, yeah, PCLs well. can turn into micro fractures very easily. Doctor can examine and say, you know what? He doesn't have a ton of cartilage left in his knee. So for that reason, uh, he's probably not going to be able to run like this for another maybe just two more years. If I'm Lamar, it's time to finally be selfish. That's where I'm at. Like, being all nice and playing even though they pay me to play, that's fun and all, but that doesn't guarantee I'm going to get paid, unlike not being nice, not being the good team guy that has guaranteed money in the past. You know, Sarah, we've touched on this before, and we'll touch on it again right now. The time for Lamar Jackson to play hardball has passed. Simply put, he could have held out a training camp over the summer. It's now week 17 of this NFL season, and the Ravens are in the dance. The time is right now. Fox's David Hellman agrees with that sentiment, and he countered Acho's argument 
with this. Again, you're talking about guys that have made business decisions out of the season. Yeah, yeah that's, that's Tyler Murray did this in the offseason. Yeah. Sean McVay and Aaron Donald did this right after the Super Bowl. This is a situation where, like, it's all out there in front of you if you're the Ravens. You could even still win the division. They've got two, what, two division games yeah. left, one of them against the Bengals. They already beat the Bengals once this year. Like, it's all in front of the Ravens. And so if he is healthy enough to play and doesn't, you don't think that's going to leak? You don't think that's going to be a story? Like, when you talk about the money that's involved, these are the types of things that become stories. Like, oh, Lamar Jackson, like, he was cleared to play two weeks before the season don't and it didn't think, want no, to. Joy- you know, David is absolutely right. Of course, something like that would leak. The NFL world has been paying close attention to Lamar's every single move. And if it were to come out that Lamar was healthy and held out on his teammates two weeks before the playoffs, Bobby, that would be a bad look. And don't get me wrong, he'd still get paid, but it would be a bad look. And you know who has said that would be a bad idea? Lamar Jackson himself. He said he would never do that to his teammates And he said that back in training camp, he didn't want to let them down in training camp, let alone two weeks away before the postseason. And if anyone knows Lamar, they would know he loves ball way too much to sit out if he was healthy enough to play. Partner, if we're taking him by his word in the past, to your point, then I think we can be confident in believing that if he's medically cleared and can physically play, he's going to be out there. Now, whether that's this week, next week, or come postseason, we don't know. What we do know is that when he is healthy and available to his team, this organization and this team is dangerous and certainly capable of going on a run at any point in time. We've talked about this at nauseum at this point. We're talking about a 10-5 and team right now that has not come anywhere close to playing A-level football all season long entering Week 17. And still to come here on The Vault, the Ravens still have a lot to play for with the AFC North title still up for grabs. But what about conference seating implications beyond that? We'll get to all of that. Stay tuned. So in light of the debate we just highlighted in that first topic about whether Lamar and the Ravens should take their time with the MVP's return, we can't lose sight of playoff seeding, which is very much still up in the air, Sarah. And Bobby, while the Ravens have clinched a playoff spot and nothing can take that away from them over the last two games of the season, but how Baltimore finishes will go a long way in determining how tough of a playoff road they'll have to travel. Because Bobby, if the Ravens were to lose out against the Pittsburgh Steelers at home and then on the road in Cincinnati over the next two weeks, they could wind up as the number seven seed, dead last, which would be a brutal road in the playoffs. In that scenario, they'd have to open up on the road in either Buffalo or Kansas City. And if by some miracle, the Ravens were to beat one in that first round, they'd have to face the other one in round two, and that's coming against a number one seed feeling rested coming off of a bye. Now, contrast that, if the Ravens could somehow win the final two games, then they'd get the AFC North crown and become the number three seed with a home game. That'd be a much nicer road to travel. Let's not forget, too, Sarah, that the NFL schedule makers sure seem to understand the importance and implications surrounding this week's Steelers-Ravens showdown. They ended up flexing the game from a 1 p.m. start time on New Year's Day to a primetime 8:20 kickoff, bumping the previously scheduled Rams-Chargers game. So all of a sudden, it's the first time these two divisional enemies face off under the primetime lights in four years. Should be a good one. And if playoff seating wasn't enough motivation, Baltimore can also hand Mike Tomlin his first losing season ever as a head coach. Plus, a win would end Pittsburgh's playoff hopes if they haven't already been dashed by previous games come kickoff. So the the drama that's about to unfold in week 17 should be can't miss stuff. A win with all those implications, Bobby, that sounds like a great way to kick off 2023. But this game is nowhere near a gimme. The Ravens did beat the Steelers in Pittsburgh a couple weeks ago, and that was with Tyler Huntley leading the way. But they barely escaped by the skin of their teeth in a 16-14 victory. 
this week's game could easily go the other way, which is why it sure would be nice to have Lamar Jackson back if he's healthy. So, partner, what's the percentage of likelihood Baltimore has for each seed running from one through seven? And I got to wonder, is the top overall seed out of reach at this point? Yeah, it is. That's correct. The Ravens have already been eliminated from the top spot, and they're also eliminated from the fourth seed because that will go to the winner of the AFC South. So, according to ESPN's Football Power Index, their chances for the number two seed is just 1%. The number three seed, that's if they win the AFC North, that's 35.5%. Now contrast that with the Bengals. Their chances are at 63.6. Like I said, number four is out. Number five, that's a 29.4% chance. Number six, same chances as number five, 29.4. And then finally, number seven, there's that 4.7% chance that they desperately want to avoid. Yeah, and while that number three seed would be nice, my guess is the fifth or sixth seed would be their landing spot at this point. And if that were to be the case, Sarah... What would be some potential matchups we could see play out there? Well, actually, if the season ended today, Baltimore would be that number five seed and they'd play on the road in Jacksonville. So we remember Jaguars had that come from behind win against Baltimore a couple weeks ago. So that would be an opportunity to exact some revenge there. Now, outside of that, there's so many other potential opponents, including the Chargers, the Dolphins, Titans, Patriots, Jets, maybe some others. So that's why a lot will still be determined over these next two weeks. Well, I'll just finish with this then. Any of those scenarios sound better than opening up in Buffalo or Kansas City. So the Ravens are going to want to make sure that doesn't happen by getting a win over their bitter rival on Sunday with the whole football world watching. All right, Bobby, your guy, Morgan Moses' play as of late has us devoting an entire topic to the big fella who has been holding it down at right tackle for the Ravens this season. You know, Sarah, what was the scouting report on this guy when the Ravens brought him in this offseason, right? Like consistency, durability, reliability. I mean, he's proven to be all of those things this year, which is why I picked him as the newcomer I'm most excited to see during one of our preseason episodes. And as I recall, it's been a while, but as I recall, (laughs) you playfully laughed in my face. Oh, I for sure did. And if you'd picked it again, I'd still laugh. But not because Uh, I uh, thought Morgan Moses was going to be bad on the field. It was more because of the position he plays. Usually, offensive line... And exciting are two phrases that don't go together. There were a ton of draft picks and other free agent moves to choose from, but whatever, I digress. I'm happy Moses, your guy, has been playing well. Look, admittedly, he wasn't a sexy selection, and I said that at the time, but I also knew that they needed to stabilize the right side of this line after last year's revolving door, and that's exactly what Moses has provided stability, and so much more. He was the highest graded Raven, according to PFF, in Saturday's win over Atlanta. And PFF also thinks he's been the top offensive tackle in all of football over the last two months for players who've logged at least 400 snaps. I mean, Sarah, he's allowed just four pressures and zero zilch, nada, QB hits, while grading out as the league's second-ranked run blocker over this two-month timeline we're talking about here. So it's just impressive stuff. Did he struggle a little bit early on? Sure. But man, from a rushing attack standpoint, uh, he has been extremely versatile. We'll hear more on that from Harbaugh in just a minute here, but I've been impressed. And for a guy whose 2022 cap hit this season is just $2.6 million, I'd say that is a bargain. Baltimore's front office has really fortified key parts of its O-line over the last couple of years via free agency. There's this Moses signing last offseason and then Kevin Zeitler the year prior. So they've definitely built a wall around Lamar. I still can't get over that Pro Bowl snub for Kevin Zeitler. It's like if he had social media, would he be invited to the Pro Bowl? What is even the Pro Bowl anymore? There's no game. It's a bunch of competition. Sounds like a bunch of nonsense if you ask me. But remember this too, Sarah. This is the first season of a three-year deal for Moses, whose cap hit increases to $4.4 million in 2023 and then $5.5 million for 2024. Harb spoke very highly of the now nine-year NFL veteran during his Monday press conference. Yeah, Morgan's done a great job. I mean, Morgan's one of the, you know, he does a great job in everything. He's such a 
such a dynamic personality too, you know, enthusiastic guy, loves football. But his pulling has been really something. I would put Ronnie in the same category. I mean, both those guys have been just extraordinary in terms of the pulling. It's been a big part of what we've been doing, pulling our tackles and our guards the last four or five weeks. And, uh, you know, he's just really good at it. And before we fly, some other quick news items you need to know. Beginning with the Humphrey Family Christmas rap song. It's an absolute must-see that you can't truly appreciate without heading to YouTube to watch. But it features Marlon Humphrey's whole family, including siblings, mom and dad, and I'm pretty sure I saw Grandma Humphrey in there. They're all dressed up in the vintage Run DMC hats, glasses, and gold chains. Here's a fun small snippet. My name is Marlon with the mic in my hand. I'm chilling, I'm cooling just like a snowman. So open your eyes, lend us an ear. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year! And after we mentioned coming off the top, John Harbaugh gave a moving message on Christmas Eve, but that Christmas spirit was gone by Monday. He gave several freezing cold responses to reporters' questions Monday. But my favorite was when he was asked about Brandon Stevens flopping to sell a holding call that nullified a Falcons touchdown Saturday. And hey, Stevens himself seemed to acknowledge his acting performance by posting an Oscars trophy to Twitter after the game. But Harbaugh, he wasn't interested in any of that discussion. I think he uh, acknowledged on Twitter after the game that maybe he was uh, have a bit of a sell job on the, uh, the holding penalty that he drew uh, when, they, when they ran uh, the touchdown. That he like, tweeted that an Oscar picture. Is, is that instinctual <laughs> or is that just... Uh, I have no idea Oscar? what you're talking about. <laughs> but where he drew the... I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Former Ravens special teams coach Jerry Rosberg, who has been working as a senior assistant coach in Denver, is now taking over as the Broncos' interim head coach, effective immediately, according to ESPN's Adam Schefter. And finally, the Ravens are three-and-a-half-point favorites against the Steelers on Sunday night. Thanks for listening to the Morning Ravens Vault, a podcast unaffiliated with the team. We created our show to keep you plugged into all things Ravens. If you've been enjoying our content, please tap that follow button and consider sharing it with a friend. You can also catch us on YouTube by searching Ravens Vault Podcast, and we are closing in on 3,000 total subscriptions. So help us get to one of our early benchmarks. And we'd love to hear from you with comments, questions, or if you'd be interested in advertising. You can reach us by email via BaltimoreRavensVault at gmail.com. So that's all the time we've got today, but be sure to check out our Ravens-Falcons instant reaction from over the weekend if you haven't already.